Yay. Um, you know how... So before... Uh, before we go into the word, while I was sitting there, you know how um, on Send Proof that we watched the last week or week before last or whatever, um, there was some there was such integrity to um, being sure that what is the Lord is actually the Lord and not saying things are the Lord when they're not. You know, it's it, there. There was a that was part. Like some people were uncomfortable with some of the skepticism. But on the other hand, there's something very um, just righteous about uh, the integrity of if, if something is the Lord, then being able to have that documented. Um, I know, uh, I don't know, a month ago or something, there was some photos being circulated um, here with the kids with the flags, but there was like these white f- flashes. Um, and this isn't like, don't take this as a personal insult to anyone. I'm just saying someone had um, shown um, Leah and I the pictures, and Leah's a photographer, so she knows um, how these things work or whatever. And um, she said, no, that's like a leftover or something. I don't even know. But it was something, some effect, some photographic effect, not an actual angel in the room that they were photographing, right? And there's just something, um, there's just something right about being integrous in the, in the things. Um, that's it. So I want to tell you guys something because of Kevin saying that thing about something dripping from the ceiling. Um, I have, so in October... When Dino came, there was something dripping, and it didn't make sense to me. Like, it just seemed kind of random. Um, Not a particular anointing of the Spirit, necessarily. Not that he wasn't anointed, but do do you know what I mean? It just was like, so um, let me tell you, a long time ago, when we first got in the building, there was an event where there was a ton of dripping, and I called uh, Lemoyne, had Michael Glasso, who was over the project, called him and said, you know, some, there's a leak or something in the ceiling. Would you come look? He, he came first, looked at everything. He said, there's no plumbing up there. There's no way that there's any, there's no air conditioner, anything. Um, he ended up bringing, uh, coming back again and bringing a little team with him. And they had these like heat and flared guns and stuff. And they investigated everything. And they said, no, there's no reason for anything so for us, that was like, okay, this is a supernatural event because we checked it out, you know? But then there were a couple of other times when that happened. And so, including this one with Dino. So after this happened with Dino, I contacted Michael again and said, this, this doesn't make sense. I need to check into this. Um, I contacted another guy who is an expert. He's in Illinois, who's an expert in like metal buildings and how it in, interacts with the um, environment. And so I don't have any answers yet, but I'm just saying that I am not, I'm just not sure. Um, and that's all. And then I, I hope, hopefully, I'm proven wrong and it's awesome. But I mean, d- Nicole, do you remember we were in an IFOC training meeting? And something like leaked and we went and got a bucket, like a little thing. And it just did it a couple times and it was done. So, but I just don't know. So that's, I just want to say for the sake of integrity and I'm checking it out. And I hope that it's the Lord. But if it's not too, I want to be integrous about that. I just felt when Kevin said that, I'm like, I just need to say that publicly for the sake of integrity while, while we're checking that out. Because honestly, honestly, in my heart of hearts, I, I think that there's something else going on and I don't know what that would be. But because it's too random for it to happen on occasion. And it's not on occasion, like it's not even every year. It's just been a, a couple of things that seem weird. All right. Let's pray. And can I say too, that doesn't mean the real doesn't happen, right? Like, but it's in the integrity that then the church becomes a light to the world because there are the documented things that happen. Yeah. 
All right, let's pray. Father, we, we just want to be righteous. We want to believe you for all that you have for us. And at the same time, we want to be people of integrity and character and righteousness and truth. We thank you for your power among us. We thank you for the power that's available. And Lord, we know that as we walk deeply rooted in truth, that we will see more and more of miraculous signs and wonders and miracles that will lead many to you, that will authenticate the message of who you are. Lord, today I ask that you would come in power, that every heart here would see you and know you in a new way. Bring your revelation. Would you guide my words? And I pray that your spirit, Lord, would fill in where my words are inadequate. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. I have a little PTSD. If you hear me all the time, pray, Lord, fill in where my words are inadequate because there's been... um, these people who, who follow and listen to what I say and then try to take things out of context and they'll say, put on social media or a, a, you know, a fake Google review, Chris doesn't believe Jesus is the son of God because she said this. Um, I mean, it's part of, I think we're going to see it in Acts 6 today, it's part of when the spirit of God dwells within you, it can cause hatred in the hearts of some um, but I do ask that always, it's how we interact in relationship with one another, that you, know, you, take, uh, you take communication in the context of the conversation. You don't pull a sentence out of context and then you know, hyper-focus on that. So, uh, all right, we're going through Act 6 today. I hope that's not all too heavy. Joyful too. (laughs) Okay, so we started in Acts 1, right? With Jesus' ascension into heaven, his instructions to the 12 apostles to go and wait for the promised Holy Spirit. Then we got into Acts 2, where the apostles are waiting with 120 in the upper room, and they are waiting, and the Holy Spirit comes in power, falls upon them, and they all speak in tongues and are filled with this new boldness. And through that, Peter preaches with boldness, and um, 3,000 are added to their number, right? And then we go into Acts 3. It begins where um, Peter and John heal the guy that has been crippled from birth at the Gate Beautiful, and the Pharisees and Sadducees are furious about it. They're super angry that they're teaching that Jesus is the Messiah, Then in Acts 4, Peter continues teaching, and 2,000 more are added to their number. Uh, Peter and John are thrown into jail because of this. And then, do you remember their companions all go into intercession for them because they've been jailed. They have this intercession meeting. They go into intercession, and then another outpouring of the Spirit happens where the place is shaken, and again, they are filled with the Holy Spirit. And at the end of that chapter, we see the the outcropping, the fruit of that is this incredible un- unity, this oneness of heart of, in my, and mind among all the believers is what the scripture says. And then last week, we went into chapter five where Ananias and Sapphira are exposed uh, for pretending that they're of one heart and one mind with the rest of the others, but they are not united um, they are ma- they wear masks, right? They're whitewashed tombs. They do the right thing on the outside, but their hearts are uh, not united with the rest of the church. And then we saw the the wrath of God poured out in this reestablishment of the fear of the Lord in the church. And then at the end of that, we saw the believers rejoicing that they were um, worthy to suffer shame for the name of Jesus Christ, in spite of. Um, much opposition. So big picture from Acts 1 through Acts 7 is that we see the fulfillment of the last words of Jesus, which were that the word would spread from 
Jerusalem, to Judea, to the rest of the world. And we also see the birth of the church before our eyes. So that's the big picture over Acts 1 through Acts 6 and 7. So now we're going to move into chapter 6. Again, I want to say that the, the reason for going through the scriptures verse by verse is so often we, um, when we preach topically, we end up just getting the pieces that we want to hear. Um, but when you have to literally go line by line, precept by precept through the scriptures, you begin to see um, some different things and maybe some different ways. You begin to see some repetitions. You begin to see, wow, this must be really important to God because he's saying it again and again and again in every chapter, which is something you don't get if you're just speaking topically. And I also believe that we are in a season where, not even a season, but there's a restoration of love for the word of God as a standard of truth. And in a world that has no source of truth, um, there is a deep hunger growing uh, for truth in the hearts of people. And it can't just be our opinions. It can't be what we think. Like we have a standard and a source for all truth. And that is the word of God. Uh, verse one. Now at this time, as the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint developed on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. The New Living Translation says there were rumblings of discontent. The King James Version says there arose a murmuring against the Hebrews. Wherever the Spirit of God is moving, wherever the kingdom of God is advancing, the enemy will look for opportunities to try to shut it down, to try to get the church off course. And we see this from the beginning of Acts. As the church is growing and the kingdom of God is advancing through, the, uh, through Jerusalem, the enemy is continually trying to push it back and shut it down. First, he incited persecution, right? Satan blinded the eyes of the high priest, the, the um, Pharisees, the Sadducees, and they were infuriated by Peter's teaching. And they have Peter brought into court and thrown in jail. And then they warned all of the disciples not to speak about this Jesus. They warned them not to use his name. The enemy wanted to prevent the message of Jesus from being preached. And he also wanted to intimidate the followers of Jesus to not speak. To intimidate them into silence. But it didn't work. They just got more and more bold, and the church grew more and more rapidly. And then last week, we saw that Satan tried to use sin in the church to shut down the message of Jesus. He saw, Satan saw this unity, and he wanted to throw a bomb in the midst to see if he could scatter them. It was a way to bring division, perhaps to see if... Uh, some of the congregation would side with Ananias and Sapphira, or would they side with the apostles? Everybody tends to have an opinion. Satan always wants to cause division among the people of God. And now in this chapter, we see a third tactic. We see Satan inciting the people toward grumbling, complaining, and murmuring. This Propensity had been in the hearts of people from the beginning, right? Do you remember back with Moses and the children of Israel? The grumbling and complaining, and the Lord hated it. And man, is it so prevalent in the church even now. Discontent, criticism of others, complaining, power struggles, you see it on a national level if you're on social media at all. But even here, I can't tell you how many Sundays someone will come up to me and say, oh my gosh, it's so cold in here. <laughs> and then I have somebody else come up five minutes later fanning themselves, oh my gosh, it's so hot. 
Or, oh my gosh, the music's too loud. But then you've got somebody else coming the exact day, same day saying, it's not loud enough. I, I can hear my own voice, so I can't really worship. Can y'all turn it up? <laughs> Honestly, I'm going to tell you the truth with the children with flags and worship. There are people who said children should be silent and staying in their seats. It's a distraction. And there are other people who said, man, my heart was so moved to watch the children worship that way with such freedom. Sadly, our hearts are often bent toward criticizing and complaining. I don't know if you guys know the name David Ruiz, but he was a worship leader in the vineyard for a long time, wrote a lot of vineyard songs way back in the day, and now he's the head of all the the vineyards in Canada. But we were with him in a meeting one time, and he was talking about working in the sound booth during a conference, and he said, um, he said, I can't tell you how many times somebody will come back to the sound booth and tell me I need to turn something down or turn something up. He said, I've gotten to the point where I just smile at them and I reach up and pretend to tweak something, and then they're fine. (laughs) Sad but true. We are a generation who find it easy to complain because we're used to having what we want exactly when we want it and exactly how we want it. I was talking to some of my kids this week, and we were talking about this and I was telling them like in I'm dating myself I can't even believe I'm as old as I am but when I was a kid you took what you got and you went hungry if you didn't want to eat it and you would never think to customize at a restaurant or a fast food place like you would never think of customizing something if you didn't like pickles well you just took them off after you got your your burger you know And I remember when Burger King came out with that commercial, uh, you guys who are older, have it your way, have it your way. It was like, what? They're going to take the pickles off for us? They're going to put extra ketchup on it for us? That was like mind-blowing and revolutionary. But now, we order at Starbucks. I'll have a caramel macchiato, but make it with soy, sugar-free, give me one packet of stevia with two tablespoons of whip, and if they put a tablespoon of whip, you're going to complain about it, you know? We're used to so having it our way, but the problem is we've come to believe that our personal preferences are deserved or that we're entitled to them some way, and some even think that their personal preferences should trump everyone else's. We're prone to complain when it's not exactly how we want it. There's a lot of research being published about neurobiology right now. I don't know if you guys are kind of hearing some of that. There's a lady named Carolyn Leaf who is kind of traveling in Christian circles. She's a neurobiologist and talking about some of this. And I want to read to you this article. It's a little bit long. Put on your thinking cap. Um, But this is an article by Dr. Travis Bradbury. Your brain loves efficiency, and it doesn't like to work any harder than it has to. When you repeat a behavior, such as complaining, your neurons branch out to each other to ease the flow of information. So your neurons grow closer together and the connections between them become more permanent. Scientists like to describe this process as neurons that fire together, wire together. This makes it much easier to repeat a behavior in the future. So easy, in fact, that you might not even realize you're doing it. Repeated complaining rewires your brain to make future complaining more likely. Over time, you find it's easier to be negative than to be positive, regardless of what's happening around you. And here's the kicker. Complaining damages 
areas of your brain as well. Research from Stanford University has shown that complaining shrinks the hippocampus, an area of the brain that's critical to problem solving and intelligent thought. Damage to the hippocampus is scary, especially when you consider that it's one of the primary brain areas destroyed by Alzheimer's. While it's not an exaggeration to say that complaining leads to brain damage, it doesn't stop there. When you complain, your body releases the stress hormone cortisol. Cortisol shifts you into fight or flight mode, directing oxygen, blood, and energy away from everything but the systems that are essential to immediate survival. One effect of cortisol, for example, is to raise your blood pressure and blood sugar so that you'll be prepared to either escape or defend yourself. All the extra cortisol released by frequent complaining impairs your immune system and makes you more susceptible to high cholesterol, diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. It even makes the brain more vulnerable to strokes. Crazy. And then he goes on to talk about the effects of gratitude on the body. He says, cultivate an attitude of gratitude. That is, when you feel like complaining, shift your attention to something that you're grateful for. Taking time to contemplate what you're grateful for isn't merely the right thing to do. It actually reduces the stress hormone cortisol by 23%. Research conducted at the University of California, Davis, found that people who worked daily to cultivate an attitude of gratitude experienced improved mood and energy and substantially less anxiety due to lower cortisol, cortisol levels. Science is discovering what God has known all along. Grumbling and complaining is actually bad for us. It's like all of his rules. All of his rules for us is because he loves us so much and he knows what's bad for us. Amanda's prophetic even when she doesn't know it. For you guys who follow her on social media, we did not talk. I had the bones of the sermon a week, more than a week ago. So Philippians 4.8 she posted yesterday. Philippians 4.8 admonishes us, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is good, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Gratitude's good for the soul. And we can easily find 20 or even 100 things to complain about in a day. But it would be wise for us to watch what we can be thankful for. So I wanted to ask you to join with me in a gratitude challenge. For this next week, start your morning with a paragraph in your journal about what you're thankful for. And it doesn't even have to be in your journal. It can be a napkin while you're drinking coffee in the morning. Just list some things that you're grateful for. And then literally during the week, take every thought captive and guard your tongue against criticizing or complaining at all. And I'm telling you, you don't realize how much power something has over you until you have to resist it. it's probably going to be harder than you think. But it'd be fun to see by the end of the week how you feel, how you feel about your life, how you feel about God. It's a worthy challenge. Oh my gosh, that was a lot for verse one. We are just now getting to verse two, like Jim's group. <laughs> How long have y'all been in two years in the same chapter or something or in the same book? Yeah. <laughs> You're rubbing off on me. Verse two. So the 12 summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. 
Instead, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. So this little infant church has grown to thousands and thousands of believers, right? We saw that by chapter four, there were 5,000. So by now, there's probably 10,000 believers. And because the church was growing so rapidly, it became too much for the apostles to manage while simultaneously maintaining their um, intimacy with God and their devotion to prayer and to the word of God. And so they decided to raise up these seven men to serve tables. And the qualifications for these table servers, did you notice that? Instead, select among you seven men. What are the qualifications? Good reputation, full of the spirit, and of wisdom. Why in the world would a table server need to be full of the spirit and full of wisdom and have a good reputation? It's because the job was actually a lot more than just serving food at a table. In the two Greek words translated serving tables in this passage, the word table was the same word for like the money changers in the temple. So remember that um, the believers were selling their extra property and giving it away so that everybody would be provided for. It seems that this job of like serving tables has more to do with that, like the administration. It's overseeing the money that was coming in and deciding how to spend it on food to be dispersed or deciding how to disperse it fairly. It was overall taking care of the needs of the people. And so the seven were appointed to this task and they would operate under the headship of the apostles. Verse 4. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The announcement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. Now remember, the church was being birthed out of Judaism, right? All 12 apostles were Jews. Jesus was a Jew. And as the gospel is spreading, it's um, going through the, the Jewish community, but it's spreading into the Gentile world as well, into the Greek world. And so if we look back at what they're addressing here, a complaint developed on the part of the Hellenistic Jews, that's the Greek Jews, against the native Hebrews, that's the native Jews, because the widows were being overlooked. So Greek believers are complaining against Jewish believers, right? We have these traditional um, Hebrew widows that converted to Christianity, and then we have these Greek widows that have converted to Christianity, and they have vastly different customs, and they're not getting along with each other, and there's jealousy popping up. And so the Apostles hear the complaint about the widows, and their solution is to bring more hands on deck. And it's interesting, as we look at the seven men who are chosen, um, they're all Greek names. The Greeks were the ones who brought the complaint, and so the Greeks are the ones who are given the job to resolve it. There's a running joke. It's not really a joke because it's true, But there's a running joke in my sphere of ministry that if you tell me something that needs to be done, I'm going to say, great, do it. If you come and say, man, we need to have a women's Christmas party, I'll say, yeah, go for it. (laughs) John Wimber, who was the founder of the Vineyard, uh, told a story about this guy who came up to him after a service one Sunday. And uh, he said, John, I had this guy who needed some help, and I called the church multiple times this week, and nobody was answering. I had to, I had to help him. When's the church going to start doing what it's supposed to be doing? And John said, I think it did. So it seems that's what the apostles did here. Greeks were complaining, so the Greeks got the job. Verse 6, 
And they brought these men before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. They were giving them the weight of leadership in the church, right? These seven had been called up to do this work of ministry that had to do with caring for the poor, caring for the widows, but it would also include, as you'll see as we're going forward, it would also include preaching the gospel. Um, It would also include doing signs and wonders among the people. And why the tradition of laying on of hands? It's a sign of the transfer of leadership and of the release of the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon um, the life of the, of the person that the hands are being laid upon. And this is not talking about the laying on of hands for healing. This is talking about the laying on of hands in a commissioning um, to do the work of ministry in an official role in the church. 1 Timothy 5.22 says, Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands. Why? Because those who are in leadership carry a higher responsibility before God for the righteousness of their lives. They will be held to a higher account. James 3 says, Not many of you should become teachers because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Verse 7, the word of God kept spreading, and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great signs and wonders among the people. This is the table server performing great signs and wonders among the people. But some, um, some men from what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, including both Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and some from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and argued with Stephen, but they were unable to cope with his wisdom. Isn't that a great way to say that? They were unable to cope with his wisdom and the spirit by whom he was speaking. You will be hated for my sake, Jesus said. Verse 11, then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. We see this all too often in the church. Do you pass around rumors that you've heard? Do you repeat something that you've not seen with your own eyes and you've not heard directly from the horse's mouth but that someone else has said? Or do you have enough fear of God that you're like, "Mm, no, I will not repeat a matter that I've not seen with my own eyes? Again, we we talked about it last week. There are seven things that the Lord hates that he cannot stand. Proud-looking eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, hearts that think of wicked things to do, feet that run to evil too. One who likes to lie about others. One who causes trouble with his brothers. James 3, if you want to pursue this farther in your own study time this week, James 3 would be an amazing chapter to read and meditate on. Again, y'all, I'm not saying this because there's something going on in the church and I have to dress. I'm just going through Acts 6, right? We're just going through what God says about how he expects the character of his people to be. And I'm telling you, the church has lost all of its reputation in the world. All of its reputation in the world. And we're going to have to look different if we... And I'm talking about legacy. I'm talking about my children's children and my grandchildren's children. If the church is to be attracted to the world at all, we're going to have to look different. We're going to have to learn how to love and honor one another and protect one another and look like those who love one another, not those who like to tear each other down. Verse 12, and they stirred up the people, the elders, the scribes, and they came up to him and dragged him away and brought him before the council. 
Have you heard that before where somebody will start something and they just, it's, it, it has to gather people around. It tries to gather against. They put forward false witnesses who said, this man does not stop speaking against the holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Nazarene Jesus will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses handed down to us. They put forth false witnesses. Again, sadly, we see this too often in the church. The problem is that religious people grow up alongside true followers of Jesus in the church. It's kind of like Ananias and Sapphira. They grew up right alongside until the wickedness of their hearts were revealed. Jesus said that the tares would grow up with the wheat. And you can recognize religious people by the fruit of their lives. They carry a spirit of opinion, criticism, debate. True followers of Jesus, you want to see a true follower of Jesus? They will be mutually submissive. They'll be quick to go low. They'll put others before themselves. They'll restrain their tongue from speaking evil or ill about another. You remember when um, Noah got drunk and his sons backed in and covered him. But the son who wanted to talk about it to others, God judged him harshly. And it doesn't mean a cover-up of sin. I mean, in this place, you know, again and again, throughout Dino and I's time here, we've been incredibly transparent with every single thing that has happened in the lives of our family. From, I mean, a lot of people were shocked that we talked about Jacob's suicide attempt the, the week after. Like, we want to live transparent lives. So I'm not talking about a cover-up, but I am talking about how, how we interact with one another. Man is amazing at this. So somebody can like, just be ugly. You know, because when you're in, under a ton of stress or maybe something terrible has just happened and you're mad and you, I, if you happen to be the first person they come to, they could be like, Mah! and man is so good at going, okay, wait, was that shame? Was that, was that really anger? I wonder what happened there. Like, and when you pause to say, man, what's going on underneath that? Then it gives you so much more grace for your brother to not even take offense, to be long-suffering. That's one of the fruits of the Spirit. What does long-suffering mean? You let people come at you and you don't react. Your peace is your peace no matter what. True followers of Jesus consider others better than themselves. Religious people are quick to criticize. They like to spread evil. They feel they're more righteous than others. They're going to have a lot of opinions about how things should be done. They're going to be, and this is a big one, constantly trying to take the speck out of another's eye when they got the massive plank sticking out of their own. And how that plays out in a person of character is before you say something about another's life, you should examine yourself. If you want to compl- if you want to say, "Oh my gosh, that person's a gossip." Okay, wait, have I ever gossiped? Oop. Because otherwise it's hypocritical. You you can't judge someone else for something that you yourself have participated in, right? I once heard Bob Jones say he had come when Dino and I were in the Shreveport Vineyard. um, Gosh, this was probably 1988. It's it's so stuck out to me because he was talking about the wheat and the tares growing up together and how we're not even supposed to judge that. 
I mean, we, I said we can judge the fruit of their lives. You judge the fruit of their lives not in, you're going to hell and you're da-da-da. You can see and go, mm, I don't want to participate with that. But Bob said, when the wind blows, the wheat bends and bows, but the tares stand up straight. The tares are stiff and unbending. Huh? Just so powerful. Sometimes I think in charismatic circles, we've done a terrible job of discipling people into maturity. And I so, I was even like, oh, I don't want to just get up here and go, me, me, me. But it's not that, okay? It's just like if we don't, if we don't get this right, if we don't get our lives right before God, we've already lost our witness in the world We've got to look different. We've got to look like a people who love one another well. We've got to look attractive to the world. We really do. I think we've done a terrible job of discipling people into maturity. Because we know that demons exist, we've allowed people to blame their sin on the demonic instead of pressing people to develop the deep character that comes from learning the fruit of self-control, of the disciplines, of saying no to your flesh, where Jesus said, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. He didn't say, like, go get a small ministry team. And I love small ministry teams, but I think we've aired too much over here. And everything that comes up, I want to go get prayer because it's easy. And then you find people that it doesn't work, and it's like, no, because it wasn't supposed to. It's not supposed to be a magic button to make your life easier. The work of righteousness is hard work. It takes discipline and self-control. We choose to do what's right when it's excruciatingly hard, and that's when we begin to develop the backbone of character. We become enamored with people who can do signs and wonders and miracles and who have these amazing prophetic gifts. But the truth is, is that those are gifts. They function outside the realm of character. And so those who are deeply entrenched in sin can still operate in the gift. And that's confusing for people sometimes. Like they see this minister that's like, operating in power. And it's like, wait, why? It looks like God's blessing is upon him. No, the gifts are of God are without repentance. Those are given. Oh, gifts are given. Fruit is grown. Bob Jones. A Bob Jonesism. That's awesome. Yep. Yeah. We saw it with Todd Bentley in the Lakeland Revival, right? This outpouring of God's spirit. And he find out later he was having an affair with one of his interns. But see, what happens is, like he's fine. They're, if, without repentance, he will pay a price in eternity. But the damage came to the body of Christ. The damage came to those who believed what he was preaching when he was being a hypocrite. We saw it with Lonnie Frisbee in the early days of the vineyard. Incredible prophetic gifting, incredible signs and wonders. But he died of AIDS because he didn't develop the character to undergird the gifting. We saw it with Paul Kane, A.A. Allen, like so many people who were incredibly gifted by the Lord but didn't take seriously the admonition to develop the deep character that then can, can undergird you through that kind of um, anonymity, not anonymity, what is it when you, the accolades from people, the pride that comes through that. See, character is what really matters. Character equals maturity. And it is the righteous acts, Revelation said, is the righteous acts of the saints that will clothe us in eternity. 
It's not how many people you raise from the dead or how many demons you, you cast out. Like, those are the gifts of the anointing. But what we're clothed with is our righteousness. I want to have some fancy priestly robes that are beautiful. Verse 15. And all who were sitting in the council stared at him, and they saw his face, which was like the face of an angel. Stephen was unruffled by all this false accusation and the lies that were being spread about him. He was a man of principle and virtue and character. And like Jesus, he could stand in the midst of it and be at peace, knowing that his life was in the hands of God. Jesus said, or was it, I can't remember who was writing, but they hurled their insults, it was in Peter, they hurled their insults at him, talking about Jesus, but he did not retaliate because he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. And here's the thing, y'all. Only you are responsible for who can steal your peace. Nobody can make you mad. Nobody can make you fly off the handle. No matter what's coming at you. And and again, it's an issue of self-discipline. It's an issue of gaining governance over your emotional life. We live in a, in a, a world right now that is only governed by emotions. Whatever I feel is the truth. But really, you alone are responsible for what goes on in here. And if you want to walk in peace every moment of every day, you absolutely, by the Holy Spirit, have the power to do that. You just have to start exercising it. This picture, his face was like that of an angel, reminds me of Moses coming off the mountain, his face glowing with the glory of God. He had spent time with the Lord. And he literally carried God's presence into the world. All right, to end, I just want to reiterate my gratitude challenge. So if you guys would join me, would you, just for a week, start your morning with a short paragraph in a journal This is what I'm thankful for. It could even be the same thing every day as long as it's not rote, you know, but what are you truly thankful for? God, I'm thank you. Thank you for my family. Thank you for all the extra years I've had with Dino because of your intervention in his life. Thank you that that my, my, my children are alive. We did a funeral last week here of a young 35 year old leaves behind twins that are seven and a three year old. Like we're, every day is a gift. And then also, you know, Scripture says, take every thought captive. Don't even allow yourself to think complaining thoughts. And I'm telling you, it's hard. It takes self-discipline, but you can do it. Like, you just reach down with your will beyond your feelings. Feelings were never meant to be like the road sign about where to go. They were just supposed to be little warning flags like, hey, something's going on here. Pay attention. That's what feelings were supposed to be so that we can look deeper about, okay, wait, why am I flying off the handle? Oh, something's going on inside of me. But we've gotten to where our feelings are, what, what leads and guides us. And it's, it's childish. It's, too, it's toddlerish. It's too, two-year-old-ish. Okay, so if you start to complain about something, shut it down and begin to tell the Lord what you're grateful for, okay? And if you find it coming out of your mouth, stop. Bite your tongue. Read James 3 again. The tongue is a wild fire. Don't say it. Don't give it voice. 
And then I want to add one thing on top of that. So this week, Amanda's done it a couple of times. Again, we had no conversation about this. But you've seen her do hashtag whatever's lovely if you guys follow her on social media. She looks for things that are admirable and noble and lovely. And then she posts those and she puts hashtag whatever is lovely. So I would love it if all of our social media became plastered, whatever is true. Whatever is of good report, yes. And just for one week, let's see what that would look like to to flood our community with this. Philippians, what is it, 4.8? Yeah. Wow. Wow. Okay, she said... The following verse, verse 9, is the promise that will come if you do this. And it is, do these things and the God of peace will be with you. That's the promise for the disciplined life. That's awesome. Yay. All right, worship team, come on up and let's pray, y'all.